Okay, cool. So hi, everyone, and uh, welcome. It's Alisa from Air Team Community here. Uh, just a small reminder, Air Team Community brings together highly skilled professionals from marketing, from design, from web development, and um, people who want to upgrade their skills, who want to meet mentors, who want to find job around jobs around the world and uh, make a career transition. And today we actually have this example of a career transition from visual to UX design. We have our uh, guest here, uh, Avesta Omar. Hi, Avesta. Hi, everyone. So nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us. And uh, Avesta uh, had a very interesting pass from uh, fashion design um, to visual design and then transition to UX design and actually work for a big tech companies like Amazon, Nextdoor. And I think she'd better like introduce yourself and like tell us a bit more about your career pass. Yeah, thank you, Alisa. Hi everyone again. Um, yes, I'm Avesta and I'm currently working as a senior UX designer at Nextdoor. It's a social platform that connects neighbors and local businesses in their neighborhoods. And I've been at the company for a bit over three years, focusing on products designed for local businesses. And right now I'm focusing on neighbor engagement so before joining this team, as Alisa mentioned, I've been working as a UX designer at Amazon AWS, working on um, big enterprise product. Um, and then before that, design agencies, also working on a lot of business solutions and cybersecurity products, um, as well as a couple of small startups. And I'm originally from Moscow. That's where I was born. I'm half Russian and half Kurdish, but grew up in Finland since I was nine years old. And for the past eight years, I've been building my career in digital design in Silicon Valley. Um, yeah, and since spring 2020, I've been working remotely, um, digital nomad life. Uh, currently, I'm based in New York. Thank you for having you me. You are. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what did you study and uh, where? Yeah, so my path as the designer started with my bachelor's degree in fashion design. Um, when I was young, I thought that was my calling. So I applied to Aalto University in Helsinki, Finland, School of Arts, Design and Architecture, and started my journey there. So for until I think it was my second year in the program when I realized that um, fashion industry is not what I wanted to be part of, um, especially at the time, sustainability and ethical values were not quite there yet uh, and not very honored. So I felt like it was creating more problems than solving problems. And I wanted to be solving problems as a designer. And um, I knew that design was my calling, but I wasn't sure where to apply my, my skills until I found a completely new master's program called International Design Business Management at the same university. And we that's where we studied a lot of product and product and innovation management service design and design thinking and I learned a wide variety of uh, things where you can apply your design thinking and design skills uh, in so many different forms and so yes that was my introduction to that's when I get, got exposed to um, information technology and innovation and uh, understood like the wide variety of possibilities in the field. Okay and you said that you moved to U.S. like eight years ago? Yeah. And what was your first job here? Mm -hmm. I came to work for a San Francisco based um, healthcare startup called Better Doctor. It was a doctor search tool and was trying to solve um, some of the healthcare problems that are so prevalent in the US. 
Um, so if you're lucky to have an insurance, it's uh, very difficult to find the care that you need and that is covered by your insurance. So we were trying to match patients with the best healthcare professionals based on their health insurance plans. And it was a small startup. I think it was Series B when I joined it. Um, and eventually it changed their business model and got acquired by another big data company. Um, but yeah, I got a chance to work there for a little bit less than two years. Was it a UX designer job right away or was it a visual design still? Yeah, it was a UX design at that point. Okay. And um, where did you study UX design? How did you get like the skills mm -hmm. you get? Yes. Yeah, so the transition happened very organically. Um, when I studied at the master's program, I got exposed to the the field of technology and innovation as I managed, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we had guest speakers um, at one of our course uh, courses <clears throat> from an international design agency called Fjord. Mm -hmm. And they told us more about how they're applying design thinking when they're working on digital services. And I remember when I was listening to them, I was like, ah, oh, IT, <laughs> it was so boring. <laughs> at that time, Digital products were very, like, they were still quite rough. The experience was not there, uh, not very user-friendly. And um, I somehow didn't envision that this is something I could be working on one day. But after they were um, talking about their work and all the possibilities, I understood that, no, actually we are the answer. We as designers can make it more user-friendly, more, more pleasant to use. And so um, in addition to that, I found those people very interesting, smart, open, curious, and fun. And that's when I understood that these are the people I want to be working with. Um, after working in the industry for 10 years, excluding fashion, uh, the, the, the time in fashion, I, I have to say that people are the most important thing when choosing a job. And, um, and that's what I followed back then. So the career in UX really came to me, not the other way around, uh, because of this, um, this random series of events and meeting these people. Mm -hmm. And um, back then there was not a huge movement yet in UX um, and I had no idea what I was stepping into uh, at the time visual design was all I knew and I wasn't aware of all the possibilities in different branches of digital design so um, once I understood that I want to work for Fjord with those people I took a summer program at the same university they had this program called information technology program that was focused on design and it was I think two to three month module mm -hmm. that I was taking um, over the summer and that's where I learned the basics of UX and a, a lot of the studies are really project-based so I use those projects to put up put together a portfolio and I use that portfolio to apply to Fjord Helsinki uh, as an intern in visual design. And so back in 20, uh, 2012, there was no such roles as UX designers. There were only visual and interaction designers. So I applied as a visual designer and, um, and then I got promoted to a full-time role. So while I was working on projects at the agency, I caught myself asking too many questions when something didn't make logical sense or uh, the, the sequence of screens didn't make sense. And I remember that moment when one of my coworkers who was an interaction designer said to me, well, why don't you try interaction design? I think you, you could be good at it. And so mm -hmm. I did that. And uh, when you combine visual design and interaction design, uh, those two skill sets, it forms a really nice entity where you are more prepared to handle the, uh, the overall design of a product. Mm -hmm. And um, 
gradually I've been integrating more of user research and data at every step of the development process and um, sometimes even leading projects that are purely focused on research in order to inform design strategies. Um, so I approach service and product development as a continuous cycle of learning and improvement. And it really required me to work on user research projects, interaction design projects, and visual design projects. And once you get experience from all these three fields mm -hmm. and you get a chance to get involved in some of the business design projects, that really gives you, equips you with really good skill set that will help you to keep building your career in product design or UX design. Since we touched this uh, subject already, I was planning to to move to it a bit later in our interview. But since you started to talk about it, what are the three top, like, what are the three, let's say, hard skills that UX designers should have? And what are the three uh, soft skills that UX designers should have? Mm -hmm. um, I would say looking at design as a system. So systems thinking is very important. Instead of focusing, let's say you're working for a company that has a mobile app that has um, a website and um, who knows, maybe some even wearables, you have to think systematically about all these different interaction points or touch points in the user journey um, whenever you're designing something. So for example, if you're creating designs for a mobile app, you have to think about, well, how does it correspond with the experience on the website or in on our web platform? How does it uh, correspond with the experience on wearables and, and so forth? Um, also, whenever you are designing, let's say, a component, uh, let's pick something simple as um, a calendar picker. Um, you need to make sure that whatever you are designing uh, in terms of interaction, in terms of visual design, is also aligned with the brand strategy, with the color palette, with, uh, with the general visual language of the entire system. So um, you have to, yes, so also within the visual design language, you have to maintain that consistency. Uh, then prototyping is extremely important. And if you want to transition from visual design to UX design, there's a good opportunity to start working on projects and just creating interactive rich prototypes. Mm -hmm. uh, the tools are changing all the time. Uh, I'm actually not sure which tool is the best at the moment. Um, but like Framer is, uh, is one very popular one. Framer, Origami, Principle is another one. Uh, between those three, I'm actually not entirely sure which one has the, it really depends on what type of prototypes you want to build and, um, how much code, how, how comfortable you are with coding, uh, and how much animation you want to integrate. But even starting with a, something as simple as a Figma prototype is going to take you um, a long way. So uh, prototyping is another one and design thinking. So understanding the process of developing uh, a product or a service where you start with them, um, you look into the, the, the way they call it fuzzy front end where um, there are no answers, only questions. And you have to dig deeper into those questions in order to get to the root of the problem and making sure that the problem that you are solving for is the right problem to solve for the solve for to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, because so often you see teams starting to solve the wrong kinds of problems and then they launch the products and the products don't really perform well. Well, that's because mm, wrong questions have been asked or not wrong questions, but it's, uh, they could have been digging deeper into the core problem 
behind whatever you're trying to solve. And being comfortable with user research. So then you really dig deeper into the core jobs to be done. Mm -hmm. There's, there is a book about that on jobs to be done. I highly recommend reading it. And um, what's the name of the book? Jobs the to be done? Book, uh, <laughs> let's see. I think it's uh, jobs. We yes. can also send it later. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jobs to be done, theory to practice. Yes. Jobs to be done. So we can send it to our uh, members in the Telegram group later. Yes. Um, so I think you named already five uh, technical skills. So system syncing, coherence of visual and UX design, uh, prototyping and being familiar with the tools, uh, design syncing, and being comfortable with the user research. And um, I was writing it down. <laughs> yes. So, and uh, what are the soft skills that UX designer uh, need to have nowadays? Yes, it's um, communication, mm -hmm. negotiation, and collaboration. In my opinion, teamwork is extremely important, especially in the American culture. Here, it's all about teamwork and the way you interact with others. Yeah, that's an interesting topic that you touched about American culture, like coming from like being Russian and coming from European, like from Finnish background. Was it easy to adapt in U.S., like to U.S. corporate culture, because you worked in a very big companies as well as small startups? Uh, was it difficult to adapt to American culture and what are the differences? What are the challenges? Yeah, so culture is indeed very, very diff different here. So um, compared to my work experience in Finland, um, in Finland, uh, in Nordic countries in general, people are way more direct. So when we are working on something, they just communicate things the way they are, no frills. Um, in California, particularly, it's completely different because people um, communicate in a softer way and mm -hmm. they communicate in a more positive way. And perhaps something that I was struggling with um, in the beginning was that when I was asking for feedback or providing feedback, everything was communicated a little bit too positively. And, mm -hmm. and then you're like, well, well, I know that there are things to improve in this work, but then people people don't maybe say it in a in a very direct way. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is this um, uh, way of giving feedback. I think they call it sandwich, where you start with something positive, then you give um, feedback on what needs to be improved, and then you end it with another positive thing mm -hmm. at the end. And so that's the way they structure their message, which sometimes gets lost. But once you understand the way they communicate, it's easier to focus on that. Okay, I'm just going to wait wait until they get to the middle of their message. Okay. <laughs> get what I need. And then, and then you know, we go from there. Um, so another thing is that time is very important um you have to be on time you have to be respectful of other people's time you have to be fast in your communication if somebody sends you an email you are expected to respond to it as soon as possible um and in meetings it's very important to stick to the point um mm -hmm. and have some action items at the end of the meeting there is not really much room for chit chat um and in general, also small talk is very important. Uh, we perhaps uh, in Russian culture, um, also for me in Nordics, we don't really do small talk. Mm -hmm. uh, we just say hi and that's it. But when you are interacting with your team and people at work in the same space, it's almost imperative to acknowledge that they are there sharing the same, same space with you. It's important to say, 
ask how they're doing and don't expect a deep answer to that question because it really doesn't mean much. But it's important to have these small interactions and talk about the weekend or a day because that's how the, the bonds are formed. And once the bond is formed, that's when you can go deeper uh, into whatever you want to talk about. But first, there is always that layer of small talk. Um, when you are in meetings, and especially, let's say, this is extremely important for designers, you always have to defend your work, or um, you have to discuss your work in the most constructive way possible. Defend may not be the best uh, word that I have selected, because uh, design always has some room for improvement. But um, whenever you are presenting ideas, it's extremely important to also present the rationale. So here's what I'm trying to do, and this is why. And you always need to present with some data. So whether it's insights, talk to your engineers before the meeting to gather all the information, whatever numbers you need to know in advance, and collect all of that information so that you can negotiate better or uh, make a better decision collectively with your peer. And um, yeah, you really have to be, <clears throat> and, and then you also have to think about the next steps. So what's next? Mm -hmm. um, in general, in, uh, in American, again, American, uh, I'm gonna speak for California. Um, it's very important to be proactive. So when something needs a solution, you are the one who's expected to come up with some options. And then you can collectively decide which option you pick, but you have to be proactive. And this is something that uh, took me a while to practice uh, because uh, because like the, the way of working in, for example, in, in Russian culture, also it's very hierarchical, right? Uh, so you're pretty, uh, pretty used to taking orders maybe, but here you have to be proactive. You have to come up with solutions, proposals, and, and then you work from there with your peers. That is extremely important. Um, and also finally, just, um, staying open-minded, um, trying to stay on, on a more positive side and uh, be very inclusive with everyone. So um, again, this is a environment of many different cultures, many different ways of working, uh, many, many different in individuals. Uh, and individualism is mm, like pretty celebrated in, in this culture. So you have to be mindful mm -hmm. of people that you are working with and communicating with. Yeah, thank you. That was very um, representative. And what I also feel about like American culture, that it's all about like thinking outside of the box, like proposing solutions and uh, being very polite. And uh, I was uh, surprised that some people considered me rude in US because I was going straight to the point. I was like, hello, I need this. And they're like, oh my God, this girl is rude. <laughs> So yeah, you need to like um, create this uh, bond first. That was very like, um, yeah, very right uh, to say. Uh, and our next question is, um, how did you get this job at Nextdoor? Can you share a bit like the process and uh, what were the challenges? Was it easy? Like maybe share a bit more about like hiring and interviewing process. Sure. Um, one of the things that I wanted to um, actually mention just uh, from the previous uh, conversation, one, one of the courses that really helped me uh, if you're interested in working with um, in the U.S. or with Americans, Stanford Continuing Studies is an amazing resource. They have courses on negotiation, communication skills, 
and um, I took a course in communication skills and it was the best investment. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was around $500, but really the best investment I made because it gave such a great insight into storytelling and communications and presentation skills, especially especially in this um, in this particular context, American work culture. So I highly recommend that. Do you think they have it online? Yes. So yeah. if you go to um, Stanford Continuing Studies, I will send you the name of the teacher. Yeah. Um, so I will follow up with you. I just thought of it. So um, and I think it's an amazing resource, honestly, yeah. like worth every minute. Perfect. We will we will also share it with the community later. Yeah. So uh, regarding getting um, a job in the U.S. and the difficulties around it, I will maybe take a step back and uh, talk about my experience in getting a job in the States in the first place. Yeah. Um, so the difficulty of applying and getting a job in the States really depends on your circumstances um in my case I wish there was a straightforward answer but I will I will talk from my personal experience in my case I was um I would say even privileged to get support from my university in Finland as well as my former co-worker from Fjord in Helsinki who referred me in the first place to this San Francisco based um startup mm -hmm. so um my university had this program called Startup Life that matches students um, with special skills with startups in San Francisco Bay Area and New York. And they were basically um, helping with the visa process. So you as a student have to apply for a job, go through the standard interview process, and then the university or this program was helping with all the paperwork to uh, to get the intern visa. So that is how I came here. It's called J1 visa. And from all visas, it is easier to get um, however, it's valid for, I think, a year or a year and a half, something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how I came to the States. So they facilitated that process, but I'm sure that um, it's also doable without a program. But please do um, see if you can find any, any resources um, locally that might be helping you with that. Um, so, however, it also meant that I had to take a step back in the career ladder because when I was applying for the intern position, I was already working full time. And I, of course, I had a, another role lined up with a, with a normal, like with a good salary and, you know, um, like everything was set up for my future. And then I decided to just Finland, leave this, right? this, yeah, in Finland. Yeah. And then I just decided to, to go do some internship and take a step back in the career ladder. That's not quite the way I was thinking about it inside because I realized that I'm going to do this for a year and a half, but it's going to be an, an investment for my future. So that's how you need to look, look at it. You will have a smaller salary. It will barely be enough to cover your living costs in the Bay Area, but look at it as an investment for the future. Um, so the real challenge is the whole U.S. immigration system that is really complicated. And um, you always need a work visa. Getting it is a lengthy and complicated process. First, you need a company that would want to hire you so much that they'd be willing to sponsor the visa. And even after they apply for it, you usually need to go through a lottery. If you're lucky, you win the lottery and wait for many months until you actually get the visa and can start working. So in my case, um, when my J-1 intern visa was um, about to expire, Mm -hmm. My employer liked the way I was working with the company, and he decided to apply for um, H-1B visa. This is a work visa for uh, skilled workers 
in I in the air field of IT, it's um is the most common visa type. And um that's where they basically filed all the papers for me. And then I had to wait for many months first to go through a lottery. And then once I passed the lottery, I had to wait for many months until I got the actual visa. And um that is usually so the wait is so long that's another reason why employers are usually hesitant when it comes to um hiring people from abroad this being said it's uh it's not it's not impossible because in my case the startup was operating in san francisco but because the founders were finnish Mm -hmm. They had an office in Helsinki. And so while I was waiting for my visa, I was not able to work in the States, but I could continue my employment in Finland as a Finnish employee while waiting for the whole pro process to, to be finished. So my advice is to look for companies that have presence in your home country Mm -hmm. but have links and operations uh links to the US and operations there and so if you if they have an office and product team in the states but some kind of a presence in your home country that i would i would go for that option first because even while they wait for the whole visa process to be uh, be finished mm -hmm. you can still be working for the company and uh and everyone's happy there is uh, also another visa, I think, for these people. It's called L1. Uh, when you're like employed by the company in the other country, but you can actually move to US and work here for the company on the other mar in the other market. Yes, correct. Um, L visa is um, another very common type of visa. The difference between these two is that H1B allows you to change employers. So if for whatever reason you are not happy with your role or the company culture, you can switch to another company. All they need to do, the new employer needs to be able to sponsor your visa again. Mm -hmm. With L visa, you are, you are in that same company. You cannot really change. And that puts you in a little bit of a disadvantage Mm -hmm. um, even H1B. So one thing as a, as an immigrant that comes up is that, um, sometimes you have to almost like compromise on things like salary and, um, and even some benefits because you don't have the same kind of freedom as American citizens do. Yeah. And, um, that is a little bit unfortunate, but again, I would say that just see it as an investment. If you know that you want to stay in the country long-term, it's completely worth it. Even if you don't stay here long-term, it's still worth it because this experience will open doors, um, pr pretty much anywhere, uh, later on. So, uh, that would be my piece of advice. And when uh what comes to did i answer everything regarding immigration yeah i think so and um <laughs> just trying to understand what we didn't cover yet um does your company work with freelancers uh like next door uh do they hire people for like short-term projects or do they work from uh with people from outside of us yeah, so it's rare, mm -hmm. but it's not impossible. Um, during my employment at Nextdoor, I think we've only collaborated once with um with a designer from Poland, and the way we found her was um, we needed illustrations for our product, and um, inside our team we didn't really have anyone who was good at illustration first, mm -hmm. and um. We didn't have a person with time, simple as that. So um, we were looking for some inspiration on Dribble, and came across this um, portfolio by Polish illustrator. We really loved her work, and we found her profile on Dribble. We contacted her and got the whole process started. 
and she ended up working for us as a freelancer. And I know quite a few other people who work as freelancers from Europe for U.S. companies. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> visibility is really important, uh, not only having a website, but also getting uh, exposing your work on platforms such as Dribbble, um, LinkedIn, um, because that's how we, during, during our projects, we usually go to Dribbble to look for inspiration and, uh, and that's how we also find designers and that might trigger some, uh, interest. And, um, so yeah, just make, uh, make sure that your LinkedIn profile is set up and, and also just make sure that you um, mark that you are interested in jobs in the US and, or UK. You never know what opportunities may arise. Think about um, when you have some companies that you're interested in, mm -hmm. try to think about the skill set that they might be missing. Because that was exactly our case. We knew that we didn't have anyone with strong illustration skills and anyone with time because our, all of our designers were too busy with product work, product design work. And so this is a good place to start also when you evaluate the, the product of the company, think about, okay, what would they benefit from? Like what kind of a skill set that you have? And then just uh focus on that um and networking is extremely important just network as much as you can um alisa you asked a very good question about how i applied to next door how i got the job and uh what the interview process is like so everything everything up until now has happened through referrals everything okay, starting so from my intern position at Fjord in Helsinki I was working with my former classmate okay who became a really good friend of mine but she moved on and she started working in San Francisco and one day she sent me a message and, and said that hey how about working in in San Francisco this spring and I was like sure <laughs> At that time, I, I knew I wanted to work abroad. I didn't know that I would spend eight years in, in the States, but <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, it's going to be a short, fun internship. And uh, so that's how I got into the first job. Then while I was working there, I was networking. I first tapped into the Finnish community and started hanging out with Finnish professionals in the same field. Um, I got introduced to uh, this design agency, Idean, that uh, had a bunch of really fun people. And again, for me, it was all about people. I connected with them. I got excited about all sorts of different projects that they were doing. And I decided to apply there. Why did I apply to an agency? Because I knew that I had stronger visual design skills, but I needed to hone my skills in interaction design. So I applied for interaction design role. And I applied to a design agency because I understood that this design agency was working with various types of startups and various types of big com tech companies around Silicon Valley. Those were, it was very calculated decision. I envisioned where I wanted to be in the future. And I, I was thinking about the small steps that I could take that would eventually get me there. And um, through that project work at the design agency, I got into a project with Amazon. Okay. And our collaboration went really well. I got to know um, the head of product there. Um, we worked really, really well together. And when the project was coming to an end, um, I told her that I kind of don't want to leave. <laughs> I'm, I'm sad to leave. And that's how we kicked off the whole interview process. Oh, wow. And um, it was a referral at that point. And I started working at Amazon. So while I was working at Amazon you know, for two and a half years, um, this same person went to next door 
And at some point we didn't really talk about, or like I never considered actually uh, following her path until we had a coffee at some point. And I heard about all the exciting new opportunities at next door. And I thought, well, why not? Because it was a pre IPO company. I kind of want, wanted to see, um, experience that, um, working at a company that is pre IPO and that, uh, goes public at some point. So I applied there again, the head of product was, uh, my point of reference. I went to the interview and uh, and that's how I got the role. Obviously, this is a collective decision. Uh, it was only one person who knew me, but that one person can open many doors. So um, people is everything. And what comes to the interview process, they are pretty heavy here. Um, so... Uh, let's see. I would say <clears throat> you. It always starts with a portfolio presentation, mm -hmm. and you may not even need a like a portfolio. Portfolio. It can be a website, uh, and I can share a couple of examples of um, websites with portfolios that um, showcase how to structure. We're them. Running a bit late with time, we will like leave 10 minutes uh, for the questions. Uh, I think we can share some uh, links with the uh, portfolios that you think are um, worth seeing uh, also in our group on uh, Telegram. Yes. Uh, I'll share the, the link to the group uh, just in case if uh, some people are not there yet. Um, I just want to recap, uh, like a very quick recap. So to find a job like in the uh, US, uh, one of the most important things is networking and uh, getting uh, referrals uh, from people you already know. Uh, another thing is being visible. So you have your uh, website and portfolio exposed and uh, uh, have your LinkedIn page uh, updated and uh, uh, having this uh, looking for a job sign uh, in LinkedIn, open for opportunities. Uh, be strategic in your career decisions. So when you went to work for this uh, agency that worked with startups and you saw already big picture where you want to be uh, in some years. Um, and uh, I guess portfolio, like having a good portfolio and uh, having it visible. And we will send some uh, links with interesting portfolios uh, in the group. Yes, and I'd be happy to share some more information on how to structure your portfolio. Uh, so usually during interviews, you have to present um, two case studies. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's one where you go deeper. And that's where you need to demonstrate, if you want to transition from visual design to UX, you have to demonstrate um, what is the user or business problem you are trying to solve, um, show your design solutions, show your re user research skills, what user insights you were using in, in order to come up with these design alternatives and think about the learnings what are some of the paths that you have explored but you decided to um, leave out uh, what are some of the compromises that you had to make during the process this is the most interesting thing uh, not so much even the the final visual outcome but the whole process of how you negotiated, how you made the decisions, that is very important. And uh, the, the interviews are focused on case studies specifically. Plus they might also ask you to solve design uh, problems. So they, for example, say to you, I had an interview with Google that was like that. I had two uh, whiteboarding exercises where they first asked me to design a toy car Mm -hmm. And you have to walk through your whole design process and design thinking um, and how you ap approach, tell how you approach this design problem. Uh, second one, I can't remember what it was. I think uh, like a doll, um, 
online shop, something like that, uh, that I had to design. But again, you are uh, given a prompt and then you stand in front of a whiteboard and then you have to walk through your thinking. So I would advise really practicing that. Use the design thinking framework and um, really think about the design um, process and how you're making decisions and try to um, independently just practice and solve a few design exercises like that. Maybe even try to do it with your friends Mm -hmm. uh, so that you get comfortable uh, in terms of sharing your thinking. Um, yes, and Alisa, I will follow up with you with um, some more general like uh, recommendations for in terms of the structure for the portfolio and how to um, structure your message when you are presenting the work. I actually have a feeling that we need another webinar about portfolio and about interview process. I think it would be super interesting if we can go through maybe some of the case studies. We will discuss it with you later, like if you will have any opportunity and time, uh, would be great. Uh, let's see if we have any questions from the audience. We don't have that many people today, but maybe someone have, uh, has a question. It doesn't look we have questions. Okay, so um, I actually have a last question for you because we have, uh, uh, so we have uh, how to get the first job. Um, I think Luda, we covered this uh, uh, before. Uh, so referrals, um, being exposed, like having a website, having a good portfolio. Um, what else was there, Avesta? Yes, I would recommend looking for your local boot camps. So uh, look for any opportunities to attend a hackathon or a boot camp. That's what I was doing. And uh, that gave a really good opportunity to work together with engineers mm -hmm. and um, business people and work on ideas and refine them. Uh, together and that's where you can apply your design skills and design thinking skills um, so yes and that will give you some good material to uh, to add to your portfolio another thing that you can also do is um, an audit of an existing product for example and make a proposal of how you would redesign that app or service and uh, make a case study of that and add your uh, work samples, add a prototype. Prototypes are very powerful when it comes to presenting work. Um, so it will get you started and networking. That was, that was my strategy when I was trying to get, the, uh, get my first job. It was definitely a process, but be patient, you will get there. <laughs> and any, um, any courses, there's a bunch of good courses. Um, Stanford has some courses on that. Uh, look at IDEO, IDEO, you, IDEO is, was very important when I was starting out. They have so many great resources. Uh, you can do a certificate there. Uh, you can learn a lot from their case studies. And um, yeah. So those, I think Parsons has something, but like I would say IDEO Stanford are, are some really good resources that um, I'm familiar with. And so it helps to take a course and usually they're project-based um, and you will also get, get like really good critique during the process. Um, so yeah, these would be my pieces of advice. Okay. Thank you. And I have my last question is uh, we have a lot of people who are looking to find a job in the US or who are looking to make this transition from visual to UX design or any other like career uh, changes. Uh, would you be able to like give an advice or like become a mentor for some of these people if they reach out like with questions and uh, can basically can our members reach out to you with questions about their career and UX design? Yes, absolutely. I'm always help, uh, always happy to mentor, always happy to meet up and discuss. Um, and Alisa will share my contact information with you. 
Uh, so please don't hesitate. Okay. Thank you so much, Avesta, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we will uh, share the, the record of uh, this webinar uh, sometime next week and also the recap. And uh, yeah, have a great day. I hope you'll enjoy New York. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure and good luck with everything. Thank you. Bye. Bye.